Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Simon and I spoke with anthologist Zara Hankir. So Zara has put together this anthology called Our Women on the Ground, which is a collection of essays by Arab female journalists who've been covering the unrest in the Middle East over the past decade. I think it's fair to say it's already been very well received, it's making a lot of noise. And we spoke to Zara about the challenges of pulling an anthology together, about her own heritage between Lebanon and the United Kingdom, and about dealing with stereotyping both with the contributors to the book and her own work. Enjoy! So Zara, great to have you on the show. Can you tell us um, about the, first of all, the moment when you, the idea that there became in due course our women on the ground when you first had that. Um, you refer in the text to this list of journalists that you put together in about 2010? Sure. So I would say it started around about the uh, time of the Arab Spring. And uh, I was actually working as a journalist with Bloomberg. I was based in Dubai. And um, as the Arab Spring erupted, we were told as Arab, Arabic-speaking journalists at Bloomberg to monitor media, whether it was Western or, um, or local Arab media. So I was following very closely all of the coverage in the region. I mean, I had been for years anyway as a journalist based in the Arab world. But as ever, which it's quite common usually when there's conflicts that erupt anywhere, really, you suddenly see far more interest in the region. And there's an influx of Western foreign correspondents who come in and start to re- to write about the region and they start to command that narrative around the region. And while I was reading all of this work, a lot of it was excellent work, although I feel like in the beginning no one really knew what was happening. <laughs> um, I was following closely the work of Arab women reporters and I felt that they were doing such excellent work as the months and the years went by with the Arab Spring and felt that they were not getting the same amount of attention as their Western counterparts. And also personally felt quite selfish in a way in that I wanted to learn their personal stories and to know what it was like to be reporting on these conflicts when they themselves were Arab women who were contending with a very unique set of challenges. So I noticed that there was this gap, I would say, particularly in memoir land where a lot of Western correspondents go to the region, spend a couple of years there, come back, write great memoirs. You don't see that with Arab women. So I just felt like this would be a good opportunity to amplify their voices. And you say in the foreword that you had a list of Arab and Middle Eastern female journalists that you were compiling. From, yes. From, from what age were you doing this? Oh, it was then. It, it started then. around then. It wasn't sort of... It wasn't uh, something that I've been doing for a while. Okay, so in terms of the women that you chose to contribute to this collection of essays, was it from that list? There were three or four names from that list. Which um, ones were they, can you say? So I knew of them already. So Noor Malas was one of them. Um, Lina Sinjab was one of them. Uh, Zain al Hayyim was one of them. There are more, I think. I just can't off the top of my head remember, but... Some of them were derived from the list. Others, they were derived strictly from research that I'd been doing um, when I decided that I actually wanted to go ahead with the idea for the book. I felt like I needed to get buy-in from the women. So essentially what I did is I had a long list and then turned that into a short list as I went along. Um, it was quite a, um, a difficult process actually choosing the women because... I was say, what was the kind of... What, what did each one need to have yeah. to choose them? Yeah, so I think range and diversity were top of mind for me. So I really want people after reading this book to come away from it feeling that they have a strong sense of the diversity of the women in the region. So I wanted all of the women to be of different backgrounds. I wanted them to be of different generations, different types of journalists from different countries with different religious orientation, different political ideologies. And that was a lot to think about as I was kind of curating the the book and, and deciding on who would be in it. So those were all things that I thought about a lot when I was um, moving from a long list to a short list. I also wanted, I didn't want all of the women to be well established in media world um, in the sense that there are some veteran journalists in the book who are well known in Middle East reporting. And then there are emerging and rising stars. So I really wanted there to be that range. 
Can we roll back from the book itself to talk a bit about your own background? So mm-hmm. where you grew up in, in Lebanon, but also the time that you spent in the UK and then, and then studying in the US. Could you talk a bit about your own personal and professional journey? Sure. I mean, I actually think that's a, that's a big part of why I put the book together. So I was actually born in the UK. My parents left Lebanon during the Civil War and um, I spent several years here as a child and we returned to Lebanon when I was about 12. So um, part of that, as part of that upbringing here in the UK, we were constantly um, watching the news because that was all my parents did because they just wanted to follow what was happening during the Lebanese Civil War and they couldn't call their family because the phone lines were down um, and they couldn't visit because it was so unsafe. So I, I actually grew up watching news. It was just a permanent fixture in our home where we were always watching the BBC and my father was just obsessed with watching the news. So that's in a way why I became a journalist because I was so fascinated by the concept of news gathering. And um, I essentially, after returning to Lebanon, uh, basically went in the direction of news as a student at school. Um, and then as a student at the American University of Beirut, I was the editor in chief of the student newspaper for three years. And then I worked locally as a journalist in Beirut and then I went to Colombia (laughs) and that's where I met Simon actually. (laughs) And during this time was was it ever an interest of yours to actually be a kind of Middle Eastern correspondent? It's that's a really good question. The thing is I never thought of being a Middle Eastern foreign correspondent for a international media outlet all I wanted to do was to write about the place that I grew that I spent a lot of time in as a child and as a teenager Um, and to me it was more like being a journalist in my homeland rather than being a journalist for a foreign media outlet so I did write and report from Beirut um, during pretty unstable times but it was for a local media outlet it was not for any of the big names in western media And um, it was never really a goal of mine. I just wanted to be a journalist, really. And when I became a reporter for Bloomberg News in Dubai, I also never thought of myself as a foreign correspondent covering the region, um, covering the Arab Spring. I just thought of myself as a journalist. That's basically what I I felt. Can we talk about the anthology as form? Um, And how, you know, did you have particular books in mind when you were pulling this together? And how did you go about making the decisions about how many women to include, what length of essay, that kind of thing? Sure. Uh, I had a couple of books in mind. So one of them was The Good Immigrant, obviously. um, Nikesh Shukla edited this excellent collection that um, really did quite well. So I felt that there was appetite at the time for minority voices. Uh, And I looked very carefully at that book because I felt that there was a real, a great range in the writing and the types of people who were, um, who were authors in that book. And then the other one, which I think was much more relevant, was a book called War Torn, which was an anthology of essays. I think it it was published in 2002. It was by um, Western women journalists who covered Vietnam. And I thought it was such a charming and just excellently edited collection um, where I felt that uh, you were learning so much about the Vietnam conflict and also about all of the challenges that the women were contending with as reporters, as American women covering Vietnam. I found that really interesting because I was also thinking of, you know, these are Americans going to Vietnam and then reflecting on their time there, whereas what I was trying to do was the flip side of that, which is what is it like to be an Arab reporter covering the Arab world as a woman? But the themes were, they really resonated. There were some really excellent themes in there because a lot of the women were, were doing work that was, back then, it was it was really risky and really challenging for them because women were not traditionally thought of as foreign correspondents. So they really had to fight to become foreign correspondents. How aware were you when, when reading work um well, reading reports from Arab women on the ground, were you of the difference between how their male colleagues would write about what they were witnessing in terms of the scope, the theme, the angle, the sensitivity? Was it a huge difference for you? Yes, I definitely think there is a difference. Part of the reason that I love this book so much is that the women are very honest about, many of the women are very honest about chasing stories that were related to women because they were able to navigate those spaces 
in a way that men were not able to. So in some cases it was by choice, in other cases it was because they simply had no choice in the sense that they would not be allowed to navigate those spaces in which males were present, um, specifically in places like Yemen, where women have to have um, male guardians to escort them from place to place, so mobility is a huge issue. And then in other places like Egypt, where women tend to be marginalized in the workplace. I don't want to generalize, but it, um, specifically in the essay um, by the Egyptian journalist, this was a big thing for her, where you know because she was marginalized in the workplace and because she felt sexual harassment constantly wherever she went, she then turned her attention to um, to taking photographs of people who were experiencing sexual harassment to women who were experiencing that. Therefore, that really guided her in the sense that she wanted to focus on women because the set of circumstances she was presented with and challenges she was presented with, she felt that this was what she needed to do. And then in Libya, you had one of the journalists who she felt you know, that she wanted to cover women's issues because she was already told by the network that she worked for that she should be covering women's issues. She'd already been sort of cornered in that way. And she thought, okay, I'm not going to be covering things like makeup and fashion. I want to be doing the real journalism that shows, you know, what's happening with w women's rights in this country during war. So she then focused on, on particular issues pertaining to women that were quite serious. So in that sense, yeah, there is a huge difference in coverage, particularly with the local journalists. I think for the women working for international media, less so, but definitely for the local journalists. I thought what was extraordinary in some of the essays was talking about, you know, obviously the, the harassment of things which people are conscious of, but these restrictions on movement and stuff like that, like the needing a, a maham, is it? Like a, yes, a sort of, yep. uh, like a male relative who has to cover you or, you know, accompany you and literally being your physical space being controlled. But I thought interesting as well, like the line that you're taking where you're laying out very clearly in these women's voices the restrictions they face, but also kind of interrogating this victim narrowhead, right, which the West would would bring towards that so how did you go about you know in, in terms of encouraging these writers and editing them in terms of you know how how you wanted to navigate that between you know laying laying very clearly how things were but also not kind of falling into a sort of easy stereotype of that experience I think what you ask is at the heart of some of the dilemmas that I face as an editor in the sense that you know we want to be challenging stereotypes in this book so frequently Arab women are portrayed as experiencing oppression and, and, and repression and so on. Whereas I'm trying to say, hey, the Arab world is really nuanced and, and these women are incredibly brave and they're facing up to all of these challenges. But at the same time, sometimes they, they were so affected by them that it really, really deterred them from some of their personal goals and professional goals. So I did not want us to, to kind of be looking away from that oppression. I mean, Arab women remain among some of the most oppressed women in the world in terms of women's rights. And that's a reality that they contend with every day. What we wanted to do was to disrupt the idea that this was just what they are. They're so nuanced. They all have their own stories and they're a diverse range of stories. Some of the essays just completely, they do not re resemble any of the other essays. They're so unique. So it was definitely something that um, was on my mind as I was speaking to the women. Um, what I what I told them was that they needed to speak their truths without filtering them in any way and without catering to a specific audience. I didn't want them to be thinking, oh, I'm writing for a Western audience. I just wanted them to be writing their own truths. And I think that that actually worked because none of them really filtered any of the oppression that they experienced from whether it was authoritarian, authoritarian governments or... Um, Islamists or even within you know their their own homes they were all very honest about what they were experiencing an essay <clears throat> that I think that particularly struck me perhaps the most emotionally impacting essay in the collection for me was Love and Loss in a Time of Revolution by Nada Bakri mm -hmm. um, particularly because uh, in the other essays that a lot of the writers are kind of talking about something they've learned or something that they have I, they've come through the other side of hardship and this essay I mean maybe you'll disagree but I found it quite striking because it doesn't end necessarily on a positive note I mean I think she ends by saying I basically haven't celebrated my birthday for the last 10 years because none of these years have mattered 
since my husband died, her, her husband Anthony died of an asthma attack. And it was so moving because there wasn't really a happy ending. And actually, I think as women in particular, we're often forced to be able to like tell inspiring stories to the generation beneath us and always have a happy silver lining at the end. And there just wasn't with her story, actually. I, I, I mean, unless you thought there was. But for me, it was quite depressing, but I thought it was so moving for that. And I guess my question is, how was that on your mind were you just did you all did you want to have an essay that wasn't like and look I came out on the other side and I'm happy now I think um another essay I agree is one of the most harrowing in the collection I'm in complete awe of her in the sense yeah. that she was so honest with her writing and what she experienced and one of the things I love about this book is that there's such a range in essay writing as a form so Obviously, there's really very little in there that's hopeful, but that's the truth. That was her yeah. truth. That's what she experienced. Also, it really mirrors the circumstances in the, in the Arab world and the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was a failure, I would say, for the most part. There's very ho little hope to be found across the region. Nada very beautifully mirrors that experience of having covered the Arab Spring and having lost her husband in the context of the Arab Spring. And for me, actually, that essay is so powerful and it lives with me because there is no resolution in sight. And it's funny, there was a, a review on Goodreads. One of, one of the reviews said something like, you know, oh, this is not really an uplifting read. You know, it's not. Why should it? It shouldn't be because this is the state of affairs in the Arab mm -hmm. world. It's filled with tragedy. You can find glimmers of hope in, I think, most of the essays. But the reality is that what's happening now in the region is harrowing and the women are speaking their truths within the context of what's happening in the region. So for me, it's honest, it's raw, and it makes for a better read and a better essay because of that. I was not looking for that sort of narrative arc where you come out of it feeling great. Did it surprise you when you read it and that ending and the fact there was no resolution? Yes, it was a bit of a gut punch, I think, where... You, you almost want her to come out of it saying something positive, that she's feeling positive about the future. As an editor, you're taught to always have to end on looking forward, sure. especially in journalism. So Absolutely. it must have been against your every kind of instinct as a journalist and an editor. Yeah, I absolutely felt that when we were editing that this was, while difficult, the right place to end mm. the essay because it is unresolved and her grief is ongoing. This is obviously her truth. I'm not speaking to her truth, but I wanted that to come through with every essay. I wanted the truth to be at that level where you felt that you learned something and that you were moved, but not necessarily that you're getting this sort of positive spin on it when perhaps there isn't one. And I was struck as well that a number of the women had either left journalism or left the Arab world or both, right? Whether they were, you know, the lady writing from Denmark, the woman from Malta. Um, did you feel as well that that was, you know, these were these were kind of untied threads that you were happy to leave in, right? That these were people who, who had quite equivocal attitudes about the experience of their work and what it had meant. Absolutely. I mean, just looking at the numbers, this is, uh, as we all know, what's happening in Syria has spurred in part and contributed to the largest refugee crisis since the end of the Second World War. So that's a reality where you have so many Arabs living in exile. You also have so many Arabs with dual identities because of war that occurred in the region. I'm one of those people. I was born here during the Lebanese Civil War. I have that dual identity. That's why the entire section Crossfire is devoted to women who have dual identities because they were forced to leave. Their families were forced to leave their homelands at various points. And exile because women today are living or, or Arabs today are living in exile because of conflicts that are occurring today whether it's in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, or elsewhere. So I really wanted those realities to come through in the book. I didn't want it all to be, you know, just women who currently live there because the reality is the conflicts are so protracted and so violent that so many of them had to leave their home countries, particularly as journalists, because they faced ongoing threats. The Libyan author Hiba Shibani is one of them, where she couldn't remain in Libya as a mother, um, feeling that she was constantly under threat. So she lives in exile in Malta currently. Uh, the collection of essays is broken up into uh, five different sections, Remembrances, Crossfire, Resilience, Exile and Transition. How naturally did each essay you received fall into these 
collect these kind of structured segments or was, were they um, areas that you'd already divvied up in advance of the essays coming in or did they all naturally fall into place in that way? We did not divvy them up. We waited for all of the essays to come in. Again, I think one of the really important things about editing this collection for me was that I wasn't steering the women in one direction or another. I was sort of encouraging them to to tell their own stories honestly and openly. So I really had um, no idea how the essays would come out. I had vague um, ideas in some cases of what they would write. In other cases, I was much more involved with the writing process, but we didn't know ultimately what each woman would end up writing in terms of themes and which themes were heavily tapped into in the various essays. So we waited for all 19 essays to come in. And then I had a great conversation with my editor at Penguin. Her name's Gretchen Schmidt, she's wonderful. And we just talked about what themes stood out for us. And they were natural when we had them all come in. The, the, the themes kind of stood out, they jumped out at us where some of them were focusing on loss and some of them were focusing on living in exile. Some of them were really focusing on resilience. So in that sense, yeah, it happened after they came in. And how difficult did you find it reaching out to women and wanting, because obviously you, you must have researched each woman um, extensively and or you knew their stories from having read about them and there must have been something quite traumatic uh, that you wanted some women to talk about. And obviously it's a very delicate situation, especially as journalists, where we have to press an interviewee to talk about something they don't want to. How uncomfortable you were, were you reaching out to women and having... A specific thing that had happened to them that you wanted them to talk about or did you kind of leave it to them to volunteer that trauma themselves that's such a good question and to be fair um yes i was aware that most of these women had been through har specific harrowing experiences i did not approach them for only those reasons i think actually it tends to be quite common um when you're a journalist or an Arab living in the Arab world that tragedy is really not too far away from you it'll be right around the corner but obviously I knew each woman what they'd experienced because of the research I'd conducted you're absolutely right I in the in the process of of commissioning them and speaking to them I you know said to them quite openly that they could write about whatever they wanted but I did suggest that if this was something that they felt that they were ready to write about that they had um, come to terms with it in a way that would allow them to really explore the feelings um, that they'd experienced as a result of, of these harrowing um, circumstances that they should absolutely write and I will help them through the process of writing. And as such, I actually became quite close to many women I'd never met because it was almost like we developed a bond where they were opening up to me in a way that they hadn't opened up before to anyone really. And a couple of them shared that with me. Some of them would send me stream of consciousness emails where you know they were actually on the field and still experiencing, not on the field, it wasn't even the field for them, it was their home, right? It was their home and they were experiencing war or they were experiencing conflict and its fallout. And they would email me and tell me this just happened to me. What do you think? can we incorporate this into the essay? So I earned that trust with them. Um, very early on, I earned that trust with them. I wanted them to feel like they could first talk to me about it before then talking about incorporating those experiences into the essay. And I think it worked. I think it worked with, in some cases, um, I feel that they trusted me so much with their stories that it was a real honor that I was able to then help them really articulate what they were experiencing. So it was a, a sensitive and a tricky um, experience as an editor, but I think ultimately it it works well. I would say also at certain points, I felt that I, I never pushed them, but I felt sometimes that I had to step away. Mm -hmm. So I would ask them to, you know, to, to elaborate on something and then I would step away because they would need time to do it. So there was a lot of that sort of navigating the situation sensitively. How conscious were you of the the kind of fixer correspondent difference so this this line between the the international correspondent who's there or the perhaps of, of arab american origin and so forth and the local correspondent and how there's often those people are often treated in quite different ways and and how moving from one side of that barrier to the other is quite quite a complicated thing i was super cognizant of it 
Um, I think that the Arab American women and the there's an Arab British woman. I think that they were much more comfortable writing the essays because they were thinking of Western audiences in a way that they think of Western audiences when they're writing their copy, right? They're aware of what works and what doesn't work. That's not to say that they necessarily, you know, sort of wrote for Westerners, but they're just aware of who their audience is in a way that the locals were not. Therefore, that I think that discrepancy actually changed the content in in many ways. In that locals were really, they were they were writing with a different approach. I think they were just not thinking of who was going to be reading. They were just thinking, I want to write my story. I want to write my truth because, you know, they're not used to this idea of there being attention beyond a certain parameter in their lives. So I actually found that discrepancy to be quite interesting. I also feel that the locals were less, the local journalists were were less aware that their stories would be, would, would appeal to Western audience. They kind of felt, well, why would anyone want to read my story in a way? Because they're just not aware of like what the literary landscape looks like and what the international journalistic landscape looks like. More than one of them told me, why would anyone care about my story? Um, I think also because they feel that there's so much tragedy in the Arab world, so why would their story stand out more than others? Whereas international correspondents are very much aware of the appetite for this sort of a story. So it was definitely cognizant of it. And I think the essays are different. There was one um, journalist uh, um, in one of the essays, I can't remember which one it was now, but who talked about how she didn't byline uh, her pieces because how, of how dangerous it could be. How difficult, therefore, was it sometimes? Were there any issues with women who didn't want to have their names attached to their essays? No, and I'm, in, I'm really in complete awe of them for that reason. Um, I, I don't want to name names, but there are a couple, there is more than two women in the book who I believe were pushing the boundaries so much that I worried a little bit that it was too much for their own safety. That's interesting. Um, would, you, would you have got involved had you thought maybe they were? Being yes. too generous. Would you have cautioned yes. against it? Yes, and I did. There are a couple of cases where there were a couple of sentences here or there that I suggested be written differently. Um, it's a really, really tough landscape um, to be a, a female journalist in the Arab world today. It's, I mean, there are kidnappings, there's sexual assault, there's there are murders. I opened the the book mentioning um a a syrian woman who was killed by isis Uh, these things happen it's dangerous to be a woman correspondent sometimes it won't be related to war sometimes it will just be related to censorship and not wanting to hear certain voices and muzzling those voices and that was something i was very cognizant of i didn't want any of the women to be writing so freely that it would compromise their safety and yet I'm still in awe of how far they pushed the boundaries. I just didn't want to be dictating to them how far they would go. But there were a couple of cases where I felt that it would help to soften the language a little bit. In, in that situation then, I mean, I can't imagine um, so an editor who wasn't familiar with the, the country and the conflict, you know, hosting this kind of essay collection. But it just shows how important it is for the editor to be sharing that heritage and sharing... I mean, just being culturally aware in a way that someone like me, for instance, based in the UK and would would just would not understand. Mm -hmm. How do do you notice that that nuance? And um, when you're when you're now kind of reading other anthologies and especially, I suppose, with your editor, I don't know what uh, heritage she was. But did you find that difficult if she was of, you know, completely if she was if she had no relation to the Middle East of navigating that? I actually love that you asked this question. It's such an important question. I feel that it was so important that I was the editor of this collection precisely because I am of Arab origin, but also understand Western audiences. That said, um, I think it really helped that my editor at Penguin is an American and specifically a New Yorker and someone who's aware of the Middle East, but not as well versed obviously as someone who comes from there simply because I'm much more um, aware of these nuances that you mentioned but we complemented each other beautifully because there were certain 
mentions or details in some of the essays that were too specifically cultural in the Arab context. And Gretchen would then tell me, an American's not going to understand that. And I struggled with that in the beginning because I thought, come on, no, I mean, I'm sure that they would, but really they wouldn't, right? So I think that we complemented each other in the sense that, you know, sometimes I actually had to explain certain things or ask the the writer to explain certain things because maybe it was, you know, it, it was just too specific um, to our What politics. kind of thing? Could you give an example of what would be too specific? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, I think one of the things was the... So Zain al Hayim, she speaks about um, being, you know, forced to to wear the veil or asked or told to wear the veil at a very young age and and pushing back on that, and then experiencing um, harassment and feeling guilty like it was her fault. This is such a common feeling in the Middle East, where if you are brought up in a conservative or a Muslim household, and you decide you want to rebel in your own way and then something bad happens to you as a result perhaps of your personal decisions that you then feel guilty. It's not such a unique concept that exists across many conservative um, religions and cultures but I do think that maybe some people would stop and say wait a minute why is she feeling guilty? She decided she didn't want to do this. It's someone else doing that. Slimani I think in her intro to her collection of essays about women and the Arab women she talks about the special word that, that there's a word for shame that is different to our understanding of shame uh and she's Zemb, maybe I'm not sure yeah um, she talks about how it's like every woman has it when they're like basically from the age of like 10 onwards yeah and it's like modest I guess a sense of modesty and as you say, feeling guilty before anything's even happened. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe more guilty, but yes, like that is a that is a huge um, dynamic I think among women in the Arab world, which is that you know you're taught to behave in a certain way, and if you fall out of line and something bad happens to you, it's your fault, and then you'll end up sort of feeling guilty because you'll start thinking maybe I should have listened to, you know, my parents or the Quran or however I think this person was raised. So. I do think it is a very, um, it's a prevalent feeling among some women in conservative cultures in the Arab world. And I think when Gretchen kind of called me out on that, I did think about it for a while. And I thought, yeah, she has a point. Like not maybe, maybe some people would be reading that and think that she shouldn't feel guilty about what a man is doing to her. Mm-hmm. But I kind of understood it um, myself in a certain way because I'm Arab myself. I was struck by, um, you know, these women go through these terrible experiences and many of them are kind of, equivocal about it but what the kind of note of positivity or bullishness to me seemed to be about journalism as a profession you know that they were they, they seem to really believe in even though the region and themselves had been through these enormously difficult situations they were really bullish about that and i found that quite inspiring that you know they didn't they didn't in many cases seem to have questioned the trade or the you know, the craft of journalism or its ability to to hold people to account that seemed to be a thread that was running through the text certainly i think um one of the essays that stands out to me a lot is shamaya lenur she's a sudanese journalist where she kind of so her essay was translated from arabic and she talks about all of the challenges she faces as a woman journalist um whether it's from the government or from um radical islamists uh and she speaks with such clarity and she's so factual about the risks she takes and she says at a certain point you know if if this isn't journalism, I don't know what it is, what is journalism. I'm reflecting the reality of what's happening on this on the streets, on the Arab streets, and even if I'm facing these challenges and and my safety is compromised, this is journalism for me. She kind of treats journalism as a way of life rather than a profession, which is why I particularly actually really enjoyed her essay because she doesn't ruminate and she's not really reflecting on her personal feelings. She's just saying this is what I do. These are the things I experienced. And then there are cases like Amira Sharif, the Yemeni journalist, and Iman Hilal, the Egyptian journalist, photojournalist, where they say, you know, they sacrifice certain aspects of their personal lives where they're unmarried women in their 30s. But this is this is what it, what I had to do to be a journalist. And they just say it so matter of factly. And I absolutely love and respect that because they're so committed to the craft of journalism 
that for them they feel these are sacrifices that they're willing to bear because they want to be journalists and, and it's important to be telling the truth of what's happening in their respective societies. It was interesting in, in that context as well to the essay with the Saudi Arabia focus with the kind of slightly more whimsical bit, particularly I like the sheep uh, fashion show. Yeah. There's a lady, to give some context, she's working book for Bloomberg and she covers a, a fashion show for sheep where like the number one sheep is sold for $120,000. Yeah, it's quite um, a humorous essay. Really. Yeah, which I thought was very funny and nice. Yeah. It kind of had to that, that more levity thing. I was wondering if we can, in, in sort of true always note, take notes fashion, delve into the kind of mechanics of you in the, the literary marketplace with this, so the process of selling the book and particularly how that works when it's it's not just a writer with a proposal, but it's you and, and a, a phalanx of contributors. How does that... Can you talk us through how it all worked and, and what some of the challenges maybe of, of doing that were as well? Sure. Well, you know, I... I really had a lot of help from friends in the industry, Simon is one of them, um, in navigating that world because I was not at all familiar with it. Um, I needed an agent, obviously. I had to do the research to find the right agent. There's a lot of, there are a lot of ups and downs there, but I was lucky in that I think that there were, there was appetite at the time for Arab voices. This was, you know, shortly after the election of Donald Trump. Um, there were actually some publishers that were specifically looking for people who were interested in writing about the Arab world. So I just literally came up with a list of publish of sorry of um, agents um, that I wanted to approach who um, were open to this kind of uh, subject, women in the Arab world. And then I wrote a nonfiction proposal book proposal, but I, got buy-in from 15 of the 20 women. So I made sure that I was able to then tell them 15 of these people are already on board. I suggested 20 women, I ended up being 19. And um, I found an agent who was, uh, Jessica Papin uh, at Distal in New York, she's, she's absolutely brilliant, um, who felt very strongly about the project and believed that these are voices that needed to be heard. I think because she herself had worked in the Arab world as well, I, in a way, almost lucked out because she was just the perfect agent for me. And Were any of these agents Arab women? No, there were a couple who were women of colour. Um, I had interest from, from three agents, two made offers. I went with um, the first offer from Jessica Papin. And then once that happened, obviously, as you're, you're familiar with the process, Simon, you just work on the proposal again with the agent and then you ship it out to publishers and I think that was the most difficult part for me was just waiting to hear back from publishers. And the decision to, to go for a New York agent over a, a British one, what was the, the kind of rationale behind that? So I did approach British agents, I did not get interest from any of them. Um, I think perhaps I'm actually not sure, perhaps there was more appetite for these voices in America. Um, I did uh, have interest from a couple of publishers in the UK, um, but they wanted me to alter the vision of the book in a way that I wasn't quite willing to. Um, and then I decided once I had an agent, I would just leave it all to her. And as you know, our rule in the podcast is we always ask about money. Um, so again, with the complexities of having you know all these contributors and stuff like that, how does the, the financial side of the project work uh, on that side? Sure, so I... Um, I was, you know, I was offered a certain amount of money, which was not very high, taking into account that I had to pay each contributor. So I paid each contributor a, a fixed fee. A couple of the contributors even waived the fee because for them, I don't think it was about money for any of us <laughs> because we came away from it really not not earning much at all. Um, I mean, for them, it was pennies. We, we also had to pay... Christiana Manpour, who we haven't mentioned yet, who's the forward writer in the book. Um, we're super grateful to her. Uh, I also had to pay a translator who was my mother. <laughs> so she was willing to take uh, lower rates, far lower than a translator would take. Um, so, you know, I divvied it all up and it was it was difficult because I had to sell the idea to the authors. And I, and I really did want them all to be on board and to feel passionately about this because it just was not about money. Um, I had a I had one person who who you know couldn't come on board because it was just the money was too low, um, and then you know at the end of the day I felt that I was never in it for the money. They were never in it for the money. I would have liked to see more. I think 
it deserves a bit more than we were offered um but you know no regrets it's it's a passion project by all means can we talk about some of the the kind of technical writing stuff so particularly getting journalists who were used to writing say newspaper copy or wire service copy to stretch their muscles a bit and write over a a longer process and then also how the the translation piece worked whether whether it was like a clear line between translated not translated or there were people with different levels of written english and how you negotiated that i think there were three levels of english in this book first is native um i would say a third of the women are native speakers i would say a third english is their second language and a third english is either their third language or they don't speak it at all for those essays that were translated one of them speaks english but doesn't write very well in english and then the other two um they they barely speak it at all um actually just to correct that she the first person writes more comfortably in Arabic. So I think that's an important distinct distinction to make where you English might be your second or third language, but you you speak, uh, sorry, you write very honestly and emotionally in a way in Arabic where, that you wouldn't write in English. Arabic is much more poetic. Um, so it was interesting with the translation process because you know they wrote 4,000 words in English, uh, in Arabic, and then the translation would be 6,000 words or 7,000 words just because was so their writing was so loaded um in terms of journalism and and some of the women writing very technically that is an issue we face with two or three of the women and i constantly encourage them to think of writing completely differently so they were not reporting a piece for the ap they were writing an essay it's a hugely different format different different style and I think a couple of them struggled a little bit, but what I would then do would just come back to them and say, can you can you tell us a little bit more about this? Give us a little bit more detail, be a little bit more personal. Because some of the women, I think, especially the ones who are very attached to journalistic form, were unwilling to write about their personal experiences. And that's what we were really trying to tease out. Like we wanted them to be writing about their personal experiences. In some cases, they don't write about their personal experiences at all. They're really, some of them speak about the industry. Some of them speak about what they observed rather than how they felt. And in that case, I wasn't, if if that was their style and that's what they wanted to do, I wouldn't push them. But in some cases, they did want to write personally. They just needed a bit of a nudge. So I would actually insert comments, just say, how about here? Tell me how you felt. Tell me how you felt. Tell me how you felt. How did you respond to that? Rather than just saying what you saw. So that was definitely a challenge, an ongoing challenge. We're coming up to the end of our time now. So I wanted to bring this away from the book and towards you more personally as a journalist. You've written for Vice, for um, Galdem, for a variety of magazines and newspapers. And the theme I would say that kind of brings together your writing is around, you know, uh, your experiences as an Arab woman and and profiling people of color and talking about, um, even as much as your, for instance, you enjoy writing about food and drink and it's always tied to kind of, uh, Lebanon or you know you've, you've written about Egypt's national dessert so it's always I feel all your writing is politically and culturally tied back to your interests and your experiences as an Arab woman and whilst that is obviously incredibly important to you and to everyone else who's reading about it I wonder how much sometimes you worry or maybe you don't about um, being defined by that in terms of pigeonholing yourself because I read a lot of uh, well, as as a commissioning editor, I often get responses back from, say, black writers or who don't want to talk right about race anymore because they don't want to be the racial the race correspondent for the Guardian or the Telegraph or whatever. And I wonder if that's something that's ever worried you, always being, you know, yeah, I guess always being the person that has to talk about race when actually you don't want to anymore. Yeah, um, that's such a great question. Thank you for asking. I. I personally feel so passionately about the Arab world and about um, women in the Arab world and about culture in the Arab world that it's natural for me and I enjoy it and I love it. So on the one hand, I write those stories because it's what I've wanted to do for a long while. I worked at Bloomberg for six and a half years and I wrote about finance there and I was never really interested in finance. I was always interested in culture 
and I was always interested in you know amplifying the voices of of people who are minorities or people of color and so on and I was never really able to do that earlier on in my career as a journalist since leaving Bloomberg all of my freelance work I agree has been focused on the Arab world and Arab culture and I love it nothing brings me more joy than to report on this side of the Arab world because so much of the Arab world when it's in the the Western media is on all the other um, developments which tend to be quite harrowing whether it's war or the refugee crisis and so on so this is the spot that I'm comfortable in that I enjoy writing about that said I will and hopefully intend to write about other things um, I think I would agree with you on this that we do tend to get stereotyped or pigeonholed because we're Arab so we're you know we're thought of as you know this is the Arab person in the room this is the Arab person in the newsroom um, and I think it will be more challenging for me to do that. But I do intend to do it as I grow as a writer. But for now, I'm perfectly happy writing about the Arab world and Arab culture. It brings me joy. And you said you, you've worked for Bloomberg, you've worked for other media organizations. Um, you're now working in tech and doing your, your writing along the side. Do you find that that's a, a kind of setup that works for you, doing a, doing a non-journalistic job, but doing writing and editing around the side of that? Or do you think that... You'll, you'd want to work full-time in that area in the future. I miss journalism uh, so much. It's my passion, and I hope to transition back into it somehow. For now, working at a tech company has helped me in the sense that it's given me the um, editorial freedom to pursue certain passions and also the time. Um, my day job is not intense at all. Um, the company that I work for, it's a social media company, gives me full flexibility to write about whatever I want, except for that particular company, which is fine with me. Um, so it has worked for me. Uh, I don't think it's going to be ultimately my career working in tech, just because journalism is my passion and I hope to transition back into it. But I actually think that it allowed me to put this book together because I was able to step away from the day to day and the daily grind with journalism in a way that, you know, I just wouldn't have been able to to conceive of this project and have the time to edit it had I worked in a newsroom that was intense as the one that I was working in at Bloomberg. So where where do you see yourself going in terms of publishing? Do you have you got another book on the way, a book idea, or do you think it will be as an anthologist, or are you thinking of fiction, or writing something that is all you? Yes, um, I definitely don't want to do an anthology right now, another anthology, because it was, I can't even explain how intense it was, particularly with this subject matter. I can imagine. Um, also, it's a logistical nightmare to edit an anthology, I will say that now for sure. Um, I do have an idea, and it's funny that you literally just asked me that question about wanting to branch away from the Arab world. The idea that I have, which hopefully I'll be able to put together, I can't share it currently, but it has nothing to do with the Arab world. Literally nothing to do. Actually, no, there's a little bit to do with the Arab world, but just a tiny bit. Um, a little, little <laughs> Not bit. Not that I think you should move away from it, yeah. but I no, understand the pressure. No, no, I actually pressure. think I intentionally, because I had two, two book ideas. One of them was super intense and focused on the Arab world and just very heavy. Mm. And the other one is just very light, very different, very unexpected. Um, I don't think anyone would expect me to pitch this idea um, but I kind of want to do it because it will, also, as I said, it, it's me challenging myself. It's me, t you know, getting at, stepping out of my comfort zone. Writing about the Arab world is my comfort zone, and I would like to explore writing long form outside of the of the familiar. So hopefully that'll work out. As you said, um, you know, pulling an anthology together is an incredibly challenging thing to do. If you had some advice for someone who is embarking on an anthology, not necessarily about journalists or the Arab world, but just the, the fact of kind of marshalling a a, a number of contributors what uh what advice would you proffer them and what, what would have been useful for you to know that you know now at the beginning of the process you have to be incredibly meticulous um you have to be um, on top of deadlines and you have to be constantly chasing the contributors but also being sensitive to their own deadlines because specifically with me i was working with journalists so they were all already on their own deadlines but I think that you need to be you need to be sensitive to the authors, but you also need to be pushing them. And there isn't anything I think that really would have helped me, any advice that I got before embarking on this anthology, other than I need to be thick skinned and I need to be patient. Because I think I was in the very early days, I was very upset 
when let's say somebody pulled out last minute because that's very common with anthologies well you you will get buy-in but the person will just be like oh i'm too busy i can't do it anymore and i would get really upset and, and worked up about it and i think you just need to be really patient and you need to tell yourself that it will all come together if you're meticulous and if you chase the women um not necessarily women sorry if you chase the <laughs> contributors if you chase the contributors but um but yeah you just you need to be you know meticulous patient and and really really thick-skinned well zara thank you so much uh, thank you and yeah th- thanks for a t- fantastic interview we also we did want to bring this up earlier but we, uh, we should say that zara has done our social media tirelessly for the podcast <laughs> for um a long period of time um with great panache and skill <laughs> and we wanted to say a huge thank you as well for for doing that and to wish you all the best with everything going forward and thank you so much for this experience. It's been very meta for me. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. But You're now going to tweet. Out, or no, I guess you won't tweet out your own episode. I won't be tweeting out I my will, own episode. <laughs> we will tweet out your episode. Don't worry, it shall be tweeted. It shall. Thank you guys Not as so well much. as if you'd done it, of course. Well, um, Zara, cheers. We, we have been quietly drinking carver as we as yeah, we record this in your honour. I hope that come through. But no, yeah, I don't think it you. has. You barely took a, you barely took a sip. Let's let's uh, let's toast live on air to Zara and her fantastic book and wishing you all the best. There you Cheers. Go. Thank you. Thank you guys. How are you, Simon? Hi, Ellie. <laughs> I think I think in a spirit of full disclosure to the listeners, we need to say that we're doing the extra to the Zara Hankia. Um, in front of Zara. In Hankia. front of Zara Hankia. In it's her censoring us. In her. <laughs> yeah, like those women <laughs> in the mid. Yes. We're, we're in Zara's um, uh, swanky apartment in North London in an undisclosed location. You wanted to ask me a personal question. I did. <laughs> uh, I did. So, Simon, you've been spending a lot of time in the Alps writing, but you've talked about that a lot. So This is all part of Ellie's, Ellie's <laughs> campaign to prise me open like a mollusk. Simon's been doing a lot of yoga. I have been doing some yoga. So why don't you write about that? I have an idea to write a piece about doing yoga as a man. But I'm not sure I can write it because I'm not sure that the yogis would ever let me back. If I and use another angle then, use another layer because that's already sort of out there. No, no, I've got all the layers. What's your second? Zara's actually walks out the <laughs> 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 it, This extra is falling to pieces live on air. Um, so you need to find a, a more interesting angle to your yogi piece. Thanks, Ellie. Maybe, maybe why you've decided to take up yoga. Yeah, I think my because it's clearly not for flexibility. It's for what are you saying about Sorry, me? But it's I just feel cruelly judged. Ellie, how are you? Um, I'm well. I've just been to Miami, New York, um, which was much smoother than my previous holiday in Bali. Uh, I did a lot of reading. I read a lot of Nora Ephron. Um, Heartburn. I feel is my no. I was reading her short essays that I feel bad about, about my. my I feel bad about my neck. Mm. which as you know because i'm obsessed with aging interesting yeah and obviously the neck essay really spoke to me so now i'm making bloody sure to moisturize my neck because it yeah, goes you were lying about your age earlier, no, right weren't sorry? you claiming to be 26 i am 26 if not younger <laughs> um so Nora efron says your neck goes at 43 or 44 so that was my most valuable yeah, so lesson of the month. different time though that the products are more advanced that's true retinol yeah true Anyway, I think it was a fantastic episode with Zara. Um, who's it was really good. I really enjoyed the book as well. I thought it was very good as well. Um, anyway, this has been Always Take Notes with me, Simon Aikham. And me, Eleanor Halls. Our producer is Nicola Keane. Our uh, score is by Jess Danheiser. Um, our graphic design is by James Edgar. Zara, uh, for a long time, handled our social media, but now... R.I.P. R.I.P. Off to Pastures New. Um, and you can find us on all manner of social media. That was my bit. You can continue that. I haven't. I haven't. On Instagram you. at Always Take Notes and on Twitter at Take Notes Always. And um, please do leave a review on iTunes as Zara's parting gift. And if you've enjoyed the show, please do consider contributing on Patreon at Always Take Notes. Thank you. Thank you.